you define a particular notion in the abstract setting and you impose certain axioms, keep in mind that those axioms are inspired by or motivated by examples, concrete examples. As I told, vector space concepts. You call something as a vector space if it has some two operations and those two operations satisfy certain conditions and so on. From where did you get those conditions? By looking at the example, familiar example we know, for instance, vectors in plane, vectors in space and so on. Similarly, you put some axioms or constraints to call a function to be measured. Okay. From where did we get those axioms? By looking at the familiar measures like length, volume, area and so on. Okay. Please recall one of the important requirements for a good measure is that it should be countably additive. Yes or no? Mu of countable union of disjoint sets in the sigma algebra should be equal to sum of mu of individual sets. Do you agree? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mu of union A n is equal to summation mu of A n. This was one requirement for a measure. One requirement. Where A n's belong to sigma algebra, A n's disjoint. Now, I would request you to recall how this requirement was inspired. How did you put this as requirement? Why did you put this as one of the requirement for a measure? Can you recall? Actually, this require was requirement was a amalgamation or a combination of two requirements. What are those requirements? One. Additive. Additivity. Finite yes, additivity. Finite additivity, right? Measure of whole is equal to sum of measures of disjoint parts. Finite number of. This was one requirement that we had in our mind. And second requirement is like measuring a complicated object with, mesh, uh, with the help of measurement of some standard objects, like finding area of a circle using area of a polygon. Okay. So for that, what I have to do is I have to get a sequence of standard object converging to the object that you want to measure. Right? Yes, sir. And then measures of the standard objects can be taken as approximations to measures of the object that you want to measure. Something like the area of the polygon you take and make this polygon better and better, make this approximation and better and better so that the area of the polygon converges to area of the circle enclosing it. Okay, That is usually called principle of exhaustion. Okay. This is one of the thing in Euclidean geometry, starting from Euclidean geometry. These two requirements we combine to get countable additivity. And what is principle of exhaustion in, suppose you have E1 contained in E2, contained in so on, then measure of limit n tending to infinity En will be equal to, that is actually union En, union En 
is equal to limit n tending to infinity measure of e n. To measure an object, you approximate that object from inside by standard object and find the measure of the standard object, make this standard object better and better. So that is the principle. Okay. And these two principles combinedly we got countable additivity. You can see that once it is countable additive, these two conditions will be satisfied. Conversely, if you want, if you have these two conditions, you will get countable additivity. So those things we have noted in the first few lectures. So the message that I want to say is that this countable additivity requirement comes from principle of exhaustion. And principle of exhaustion basically is approximating an object with standard object from inside. So naturally you can ask why not approximate from outside? OK, instead of inscribing with the standard object, why don't you circumscribe with the standard object? OK, and then I told that there is some difficulty there. That is, if E1 contains, E2 contains and so on, then we define limit of En, obviously as intersection En. Now, if you want mu of intersection En, that is mu of limit En, question is, is it equal to limit of mu of En? I gave you one example where this may not hold. Do you agree? Yes, sir. What was the example that I have given? In fact, one of you asked some doubt also on based on that example. You take R, you take R, and you take intervals. Say, I n is equal to n infinity, n belong to it. Okay. I one is one infinity, I two is two infinity, I three is three infinity, and so on. Okay, or maybe I will call E n itself. E n is equal to. Then you can see that E one contains, E two contains, E three contains, and so on. Okay. Now what is limit E n? You can take limit E n definition as intersection E n. Okay. N equal to one to infinity. And here intersection E n will be null set. You are asking why it is so. If my memory serves me, I don't know who asked. Could you try to prove it that it will be null set? First, do you agree that intersection will be null set? Yes, sir. Yes, Forget sir. about the proof. Yes. At least, at least to our intuition, do you agree? Because when you take even intersection E2, the segment 1, 2 is killed. It is thrown. When E1 intersection E2 intersection E3 you take, the segment 1, 2, 2, 3 is gone. It is thrown out and so on. So finally everything will be thrown out. Okay, that is intuition. But now how do you prove that it is equal to null set? Okay. Suppose you, suppose X is in intersection N equal to 1 to infinity En for all N. Suppose there is a point. That will imply X is in EN. I told you, you can try to apply Archimedean property. X element of EN the next day, if my memory serves me. X belong to EN for all N. Okay. And what is EN? That means X is in N infinity for all N. And that will imply X is in this interval. That implies N is less than or equal to X. For all n. Yes or no? Yes, sir. And that, is it true? There exists a real number x such that n is less than or equal to x for all n. Is it true? No, sir, because n is not bounded above. 
uh, n is not bounded about that is exactly what is archimedean property tells you okay this is a contradiction this is a contradiction so what now therefore mu of limit en remember limit en by definition is intersection mu of intersection en okay that is mu of null set and measurement requirement is that mu of null set is zero now what is limit mu of en that is limit n tending to infinity what is mu of en ens are interval uh, so if it if you want consistent it should be infinity with the length it will be infinity and we take in the extended system this as infinity okay this is convention again okay? so it is very bad to write like limit infinity infinity and so on i will put like this since the notation wise it looks very since mu of en is equal to infinity for all n limit n tending to infinity mu of en is taken as infinity therefore mu of limit is not equal to limit n tending to infinity mu en this is why approximation from outside we are not doing okay there are some instances where the approximation from outside will not work especially when the involved sets has infinite measure okay so this is the thing that you should have in mind while tackling both 7 and 8 and in fact the seventh question demands to give another counter example to the fact that mu of intersection will not be is equal to limit of the mu's okay i already gave one example with this but the question demands you to get one more example in the context of counting measure so x b an infinite set and mu is counting measure on the sigma algebra 2 power x so the sigma algebra is 2 power x and mu is from b to 0 infinity we have already defined what is counting measure it counts number of elements in the set it is taken as infinity if a is infinite set and it is taken as cardinality of a if a is finite set mu of a is equal to cardinality of a number of elements if a is finite and it is infinity if a is an infinite set this is the definition of counting measure and what are you supposed to prove is that there exists a sequence en in b such that it is decreasing to find sequence en such that e1 contains e2 contains so on this is what the meaning of decreasing limit n tending to infinity en is null set but remember that for this decreasing sequence limit is defined as the intersection this we want to be null set and limit n tending to infinity mu of en is not equal to zero such a sequence we have to construct and what is the implication this will tell this will reiterate that why i am writing reiterate because already you know that 
mu of limit may not be equal to limit of mu if you take a decreasing sequence. This will reiterate that mu of limit en is equal to mu of intersection en will not be equal to limit n tending to infinity mu of en. This is the reason why we don't put approximation from outside. Is that clear? I have not I have not solved the question, but is the point clear? Yes, sir. And why this question? The question is like a counter example to say that in the decreasing sequence. No, even if you put countable additivity requirements, even if you put countable additivity requirement, you will not get an analogous to principle of exhaustion. Countability, countable ad, uh, additivity requirement will give principle of exhaustion, meaning approximation from inside, but it will not give approximation from outside. That's what we want to say through this example. Okay. Now forget about all this. Now can you construct, could somebody construct such a sequence? Yes, sir. Then please share with me. How did you construct? Uh, since yes, x is infinite, it will have a countable subset. We will consider a countable subset as a it sequence. What? I don't understand. First of all, here x is not R. X is any set. OK, so you cannot talk about intervals, etc. Uh, any infinite set will have a countable subset. OK, that part is OK. So you will take consider OK, I think this is what you are saying. Consider set X1, X2, X3, so on subset of X. Right, this is what you want to say. Yes, sir. If X itself is that, well and good. If it is countable, if it is uncountable, you can extract a countable subset. That is OK. Now. You will take EN from starting from X and going okay. towards so the very end. I think EN is you want to say xn, xn plus one and so on. For all n in n. Is that what you are saying? Yes, sir. So E1 is x1, x2, x3, so on. E2 is x2, x3, so on and like that. OK, then what you can see is mu of En is equal to infinity for all n. Number of elements is infinity for all n. OK, see this xi's are. Xi not equal to xj, OK, for every i not equal to j. That is possible. OK, next. What is limit of en? Limit of en. By definition, it is intersection EN for a decreasing sequence. Okay. And here the intersection EN will be null set. Am I right? Yes. Sir. Therefore, mu of limit EN is equal to mu of null set. Counting measure. Here it is counting measure, not arbitrary measure. It is zero. So that proves the second one. It is very similar to interval. OK, here in the interval, you consider the length here in the case, instead of length, you are considering the number of points. That's it. The idea is the same. The takeaway message is that the countable additivity will not give you. Principle of exhaustions analog in approximation from outside. Principle of exhaustion is approximation inside. OK, you will not get the corresponding analog of approximation from outside. You cannot uh, try to circumscribe an object with the standard object and make this standard object smaller and smaller. That may not work. 
do you get my point or no yes sir so second problem that is eighth problem is also based on the same idea you have a measure space you have a monotone sequence either increasing or decreasing if en is increasing show that limit of mu en is equal to mu of limit en in fact keeping this in mind we imposed countable additivity condition the countable additivity condition emerged from this requirement actually okay but anyway forget about how this uh, axiom is being included now you assume that that axiom is included namely countable additivity is included with that in hand we have to prove that a part is true principle of exhaustion is true could you prove that i think i have done that in the class yes or no yes sir maybe i will repeat the proof once again you have an increasing sequence e1 contained in e2 contained in so on okay, this is an increasing sequence by definition in this case limit of en is equal to defined to be i will write union en okay and what i have to prove to prove that to prove that limit n tending to infinity mu of en is equal to mu of limit en but limit en by definition is union en assuming mu as a measure that is assuming mu satisfies countable additivity we have to prove that this result is true i would say that countable additivity requirement we put into mu only because of this requirement actually okay anyway forget about that why that axiom is imposed you forget assume that that axiom is imposed and now with that axiom in hand we want to prove this requirement is satisfied or this condition is satisfied okay now could you prove this yes sir how how one can approach what i can use is only the fact that mu is a measure remember we are in a general measure space not a specific measures like uh, uh, outer measure or whatever it is counting measure nothing you have a general measure space that means we know mu satisfy certain conditions using those condition we should be able to prove this so using countable additivity somehow we have to prove this but remember countable additivity is something related to disjoint union okay here the unions of en ens are not disjoint so from ens i have to get a disjoint union and then i can apply countable additivity and possibly i will get this result so that is the background one should know the crux of the matter is from this en how to go to disjoint unions so that i will be in a position to use countable additivity does it make sense yes sir yes sir now now to prove this always sometime i may forget to uh, divide into two cases always settle the case when something some measure is infinity okay in most of the theorems in lecture also we should always take care what happens if measure is infinity because there infinity minus infinity transposing one to the other side etc will not work okay and in most of the cases the uh, special case when one of the measure is infinity will be easy to set it so you do that first and then assume that the measure is finite and proceed with the r because if you are in a measure the range is from zero to closed infinity so it can assume value infinity once it can assume value infinity cancellation 
transpose into the other side, etc., will not work. Yes or no? A plus infinity is equal to B plus infinity. Can you write A equal to B? No. You cannot, no, sir. You cannot write, okay? So, so, those things you should take care. While proving theorems also, in my lecture, sometimes I may forget it. So, what I mean is, first settle the case when some measure is infinity. Mostly, that will be trivial. And then work with cases only when measure is finite. Okay. Here also you can do that. If mu of en is infinity for some m, okay, suppose, let me settle that trivial case first. Suppose mu of, let me say, en naught for a fixed n naught is infinity for some n naught. Some n naught in n. Then, do you see that mu of en will also be infinity after a stage? Yes, sir. How does it follow? Monotonicity. Monotonicity. This yes, is mu is monotonic. And you have e1 contained in e2 contained in and so on. So at one stage, measure is infinity means after that, because you have an increasing sequence, measure will be infinity. So what will happen to limit mu of En? Infinity. It will be infinity. Okay. And what will happen to also? What will happen to mu of limit En? But remember, limit En by definition is union. Mu of union en. Okay. Union en will contain en naught. And en naught measure itself is infinity. And therefore, what will be union en measure? Infinity. Infinity. So what did you observe? You observe that the equation in the question is satisfied when at one of the set has infinity measure. Thus, thus. Mu of limit En is equal to limit of mu of En if En naught has measure infinity for some N naught. So this is a trivial case. So now onwards, I will work with the case when, when mu of En is finite for all N. Okay. Consider the other case mu of en less than infinity for all n here only you needs to prove something the other case was trivial okay. like this in most of the theorems that we prove you may have to discuss the case when measure is infinity separately okay that i may not do sometime i may forget but while doing, uh, redoing the proof, you please check whether something like transposing to other side, etc. we use. If that is the case, the measure equal to infinity case, you have to discuss separately. Did I convey what I wanted to? Did you get my point? Yes, sir. Now let us consider only the case when mu of en is less than infinity for all n. Okay. Now, I have to prove mu of limit equal to limit of mu. Only thing that I have in my hand is countable additivity. But for countable additivity, I need to have disjoint unions or disjoint sets. Okay. So, let us try to construct disjoint. And how this E1, E2, E3 looks like? This is E1. Outside, you have E2. Outside, you have E3 and so on. This is how it goes. Okay. So, I, I am going to get a disjoint family of sets. Define E0 as null set. And En as, uh, no, E is already used, right? F5 I use. New sets will be F. Define F0 as null set and Fn as. Is that difference en minus one? Ah, obviously, the difference e 
yes my en minus en minus 1 for all n for so, n greater than 1 pardon for n greater than 1 sir n equal to 1 also okay that's why i okay. defined f not f1 will be e1 minus e0 e0 i have defined let me define e0 okay e0 f0 is e0 and this is null set okay. that is why i put e0 as null set otherwise you should start with n is equal to 2 onwards anyway now you can see that fns are disjoint note that note that fns are disjoint And what about union F n? Union n belong to n F n is equal to F one is E one minus E two. This part right? Yes or no? F one is E one minus E not. E not. That is this thing, right? And then this yes. one, and then this part, and so on. So union F n will cover union E n. Both will be same. Do you agree? Yes, sir. Now what's the difference in yes. union E n? I don't know that E n are disjoint, but union F n, I know that F n are disjoint. Okay, this technique we have used several times from an arbitrary family how to get a disjoint family. Now. Mu of limit n tending to infinity e n. I have to prove that this is equal to limit of mu of e n. But by definition, limit e n is union e n. Okay, and union e n is same as union f n. Now, since f n is disjoint, you can use countable additivity. This is equal to summation n belong to n mu of f n. Okay, now we are in a stage to use countable additive. That is summation n belong to n. What is mu of f n? Mu of by definition f n is e n minus e n minus one. With the understanding that e not is null set. Okay, and that is equal to summation n belong to n mu of E n intersection E n minus one complement. Am I right? Yes, sir. And again, this you can see that this is mu of E n minus mu of E n minus one. Okay. Now you have summation, and remember here this minus etc makes sense. Because I am considering only case where mu of e n is less than infinity. So, like infinity minus infinity, those things will not appear here. Okay. Now, this is a series of real numbers, and you are talking about the convergence. And convergence of series of real number is attacked via convergence of sequence of partial sum. So, summation k is equal to one to n mu of e k minus mu of e k minus one. Then you make limit n tending to infinity. This is n to partial sum. Okay. Now this is limit n tending to infinity. Now you can see that this is like so popularly known as telescopic sum. Several terms will get cancelled. Okay. And what will remain? First one is mu of e n minus mu of e n minus one. The last one, obviously. The previous one is mu of e n minus one minus mu of e n minus two, and so on. So several terms will get cancelled, and what will remain in that sum? Mu of e n minus mu of e not. E not. Mu of e not. Okay. This is like a telescopic sum in which the many terms get cancelled, and this is second term is a constant, nothing to do with the limit. Limit n tending to infinity mu of e n minus mu of e naught. 
E naught I assume to be null set, so this is zero. Limit n tending to infinity mu of E x, and we are done. Mu of limit. This limit is union. Okay, is equal to limit of mu. So principle of exhaustion you can derive from countable additivity. That is the reason why we put countable additivity as the requirement. Does that make sense? Are you okay with it? Yes, sir. And now, where did you use mu of e n is finite? That also you should locate. Otherwise, this 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 terms will create problem. This mu of e n minus mu of e n minus one, etc. Okay, and. Uh, you should think why I have written suddenly like this. Mu of E n intersection E n minus one complement. I could write as mu of E n minus mu of E n minus one. Can somebody tell me the reason? How does it follow? First of all, this 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 is correct. E n minus E n minus one is E n intersection E n minus one complement. Is it correct? Yes, sir. You have yes. yes. You have two sets E n and E n minus, okay. and I want the difference. Okay, that is this part I want. So you will have it as. This is theoretically correct, right? I am just cross-checking. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, from this step to this step, I wrote it as mu of E n minus mu of E n minus 1. Can you tell me the reason? How does it follow? What is mu of A minus B? Did we prove that it will be equal to mu of A minus mu of B in some cases? Yes or no? If mu mu is a measure, yes, sir. How does it follow? Sir, e n is equal to e n minus one union e n minus e n minus one. It's joined unions, right? A yes. a a you can write as disjoint unions in terms of a minus b, and then transpose to the other side. We have done it several times in the class. I don't know why you are not saying. So those who are not yes, able, to, yes. So after this step, uh, can we say directly? Which one? Uh, sir, uh, summation uh, mu of f n where you wrote. I don't get which step are you asking. Uh, so here, uh, mu of summation mu of f n. Ah. Uh -huh. So here, direct apply limit k tends to infinity uh, summation mu f n and one to k. Then it is uh, mu of union f n and one to k. Then uh, this is same as e k union f n and one to k is that same as e k. Well, one minute, let me write. When you say, I'm not able to get. Okay, let me write what you are saying. From here, you are asking me to write this. So can you tell one by one? Uh, I sir, want to limit. Uh, this limit is k dash to summation n k is equal to one to n mu of e k n tending to infinity f k yes mu of f k yeah. So this series you are trying to write write some, uh, convergence of series you are writing as convergence of sequence of partials. Okay, now yes. whether mu of, mu of f n is finite? Whether mu of f n is finite? Yes, sir. We have taken e n yes, is finite. Yes, sir. Finite, right? Mu of e n mm -hmm. Okay, next step. That is equal to limit n tends to infinity. Uh, n to countably infinity. additive mu yes, of union f n. F k s are disjoint. Yes, sir. Excellent. This yes, is sir. mu of union f k. 
me n k is equal to 1 to n f k okay so now union f k k 1 to n is same as e n that is equal to limits n tending to infinity mu of mu of e n union k equal to 1 to n e n no sir uh, union f k k 1 to n is e n this is e n yes sir, it is contained in one other can you say this is equal to e n i don't get yes sir that theory you have to check it so you are saying you are claiming that union f k is e n yes sir ah, what is the next word oh you are done yes, right? yes you are done okay so only thing is to see that this union f k i am okay with it once you can prove that union k equal to 1 to n f k is e n you are done okay did i answer your question yes sir steps are valid provided that union equal to en is okay yeah. so let me remove all these things yeah so we have proved he is giving an alternative that is okay it seems okay now the second part of b oh we are taking too much time to solve one question yeah b part b part when you read you should read along with the seventh question in seventh question you saw that limit of mu of en may not be equal to mu of limit en for decreasing sequence and what was the issue the issue we gave two counter examples one in the counter measure setting uh, counting measure setting and the other in the usual r setting interval setting okay in both case what happened was mu of ens were infinity yes or no yes sir but now you read the eighth b part if en is decreasing then also limit of mu of en will coincide with mu of limit en no issue provided mu of e1 is finite or it is given in a slightly different way there is a set such that a is of finite measure and a contains e1 and that will give you that e1 is of finite measure yes or no yes sir once e1 is of finite measure everything else is of finite measure e2 e3 e4 etc Yes. yes, sir. Because yes, sir. It is contained in one. Basically, the result is true if you have each mu n is of finite measure. Okay. So the principle of exhaustion, the approximation from outside, is okay provided the standard object has finite measure. Otherwise, approximation from outside will create an issue. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So now that is the point, whole point of 8B. Now I think I can leave it to you. It's not difficult. Say very similar process. The central idea is from union, I have to go for the, uh, what I can use is only countable, uh, I mean additivity. And for that I need a uh, disjoint union. Okay, so you try to do that. Let me not do it. Okay, you try to do it. B part. I do have a complete solution. I tried it, but I don't want to write it here. Please do it yourself. And let me at least touch problem sheet two. Okay, tutorial sheet two. Don't have to hesitate if you are not able to solve eight part eight B part, but I don't want to spend time now. Tutorial sheet two is mainly on outer measure, Lebesgue outer measure and uh, measurability, which just now we have introduced in last lecture. I mean, just introduced. We have not uh, done much on measurability. 
But first few pro problems are on outer measure. Okay. So forget about uh, sigma algebra, general measure and so on. Now we are in R and we are with the Lebesgue outer measure. Okay. The first question. E subset of R show that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an open set G epsilon in R such that E is contained in G epsilon. E is given to you. You can find an open set G epsilon such that measure outer measure of G epsilon is less than or equal to outer measure of epsilon E plus epsilon. Okay. What is the intuition? How do you understand this problem intuitively? Please listen or uh, sorry. Please uh, recall that the outer measure definition we went like this. First, I can define uh, length of open interval. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Then I can define measure for disjoint union of open intervals. Yes. Therefore, I can measure any open sets. Because open sets are countable union of disjoint open intervals. Yes, right? sir. Yes, sir. Like starting from rectangles, I can go up to polygons, and polygons can be used for measuring the area of the circle. Similar to that, starting with the interval, I can go up to open sets. Now, open sets I know how to measure. Okay. And then what we did, any arbitrary set. What we do is we enclose inside a open set. Open and get the get the measure of that open set that is called overestimate and then make this overestimate better and better. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. Here, this problem, what it tells you is the following. You assume that all the measure involved is finite. Then I can write that inequality as m star of g epsilon minus m star of e is less than or equal to epsilon. The difference between measure of the open set and measure of the set which you want to measure is less than or equal to epsilon. That means given any set, I can find an open set such that the difference between measuring the given set and measuring the open set can be made less than any tolerance level epsilon. That is, given any set, I can always find a open set whose measure approximates the measure of the given object by an amount epsilon. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Let me repeat. Given any set, I can find an open set larger than that, such that the difference of measure of the open set and measure of the given set is any arbitrary pre-assigned quantity epsilon. Epsilon can be made small. That means this open set will approximate given set in the measure sense, in the outer measure sense. Meaning difference between outer measure of the open set and outer measure of the given set can be made less than any small amount epsilon. Did you get it? Yes, sir. Got it. Yes, yes, yes sir. Just proving the problem is not what is important. You should understand the relevance of the problem, why that problem is given, and what is intuitionally what it happens there. So I like. Weierstrass approximation theorem tells you that any arbitrary function you can approximate by a open set. Weierstrass approximation theorem. Any continuous function can be, I don't know what word I have used, sorry. Let me repeat what was in my mind is this. Weierstrass approximation theorem says that any continuous function can be approximated by a polynomial. Yes or no? Yes, sir. In a closed bounded interval, every continuous function can be approximated by a polynomial. I repeat, 
every continuous function can be approximated by a polynomial means the difference between the function and the polynomial can be made less than epsilon in the mesh lebe counter measure setting what our problem tells is that any set can be approximated by a open set in the mesh outer measure sense meaning outer measure of the open set minus outer measure of the given set is less than epsilon so it is like an approximation process you are approximating given set with an open set so that the difference in the measure is as small as possible does it make sense yes sir so the, what what the message that i want to give is simply don't try to uh, so give a some complete solution of the problem read the problem interpret and get your own no feeling to that problem why that problem is given what it indicates intuition intuition is what what it you know as a layman's understanding what is happening there this epsilon etc etc is mathematician's language you should try to understand what how this thing can be explained to a layman explain to a layman this problem is like this given any set i can approximate it by a open set in the sense of outer measure when i say approximation difference should be small difference of what difference of outer measure how small however small you want epsilon is arbitrary okay no we don't have time but how does we proceed please remember that outer measure is by definition an infimum yes or no yes sir yes sir yes, there is something connected with epsilon there is something connected with epsilon that's the problem so immediately you should remind that if something is a greater lower bound anything greater than it cannot be a lower, lower bound lower bound therefore m star of e plus epsilon cannot be a lower bound for the set okay so that is the starting point m star of a is greatest lower bound therefore m star of e plus epsilon is not a lower bound not a lower bound for what that set what is that set summation l of i n isn't it yes sir so i don't have time i think you two have a class so just apply the definition of uh, m star of e and use the fact that m star of e is the infimum you will get the first problem okay. of course we will discuss in the next class let me end